It's a great pleasure today for me to introduce uh, David Wang to give us a Wednesday seminar. Of course, uh, David is, is, is well known to almost all of you, but I'll just say a couple of things about his background. Uh, he uh, did uh, clinical training in both internal medicine and hematology in, in London, followed by a, a PhD in molecular oncology and molecular biology. And then he came to Weihai in uh, 1994, having uh, first a uh, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society fellowship, followed by several other fellowships. Uh, and he's spearheaded a lot of the work uh, in our division on trying to understand the, particularly the biochemistry of how the BCL2 apoptotic switch works. And he's always had a strong interest uh, in the clinical application of these findings. And he essentially managed all of our contacts of WEHI with Genentech and Abbott and, the, and our collaboration to try to discover molecules that would um, act to turn, turn on this switch in cancer cells to, to get better treatments of cancer. Therefore, D David was an ideal person to be chosen to be the head the new division of chemical biology in, in 2010. And he'll tell us today about some of his work identifying and targeting cancer cell susceptibilities. Thank you very much, Jerry, um, and thank you everybody for coming. Um, so as Jerry said, it, it, it has been um, 19 years since, uh, almost 19 years since I started working on this pathway, and um, we are still at it, which means it's either I'm, either I'm very slow or it is very interesting or there's a lot to do. Hopefully it's a combination of all those. So this is a pathway that is familiar to many of you, and it really governs a key um, the key pathway that determines whether a cell lives or dies by apoptosis. And the key mediators of this process, as most of you are aware, are these two molecules called Bax and Bax. And we, until, you know, the beautiful work, recent work uh, by Peter Zabatar um, uh, and colleagues and Coleman, we really understand very little as to how Bax and Bax uh, cause uh, damage to the mitochondria. But we know that normally bags and bags are present in, in, in pretty high amounts in cells, but they're restrained by the pro-survival proteins, including BCL2, BCLX cell, and MCL1. And in turn, these proteins are regulated by BH3 on the protein. So the BH3 on the proteins act principally as sensors of the pathway, and once they're activated by damage signals, they, uh, they take out the activity of the pro-survival BCL2 proteins to allow Bax and Bax to become acti activated and cause mitochondrial damage. The consequence of Bax and Bax causing mitochondrial damage is really the leakage of uh, toxic factors essentially from within the mitochondria into the cytosol, such as uh, cytochrome C. And these uh, factors lead to the activation of enzymes called cas caspases that mediate uh, cell cellular demolition. So the key component of this pathway is really the interactions between the family members, which is really being the focus of my work and that of my lab for, for many, many years. Just to focus down a little bit for the purposes of today, the most important proteins I'd like to address are BCL2 itself, and particularly um, it's important as a therapeutic target it's close relative BCL cell, and increasingly, a lot of our focus of our work is on this other pro-survival protein, MCL1. So as I said, this pathway is, is, is uh, uh, triggered by the BH3 only proteins, and our major contribution a number of years ago now is to figure out that the BH3 only proteins are not functionally equivalent. So it was thought for many years that uh, any of them can replace each other, but we undertook binding studies driven pr primarily by Lin Chen when she was in my lab, and she was able to show that the BH3 only proteins vary strikingly in their ability to bind the pro-survival proteins. So some uh, BH3 only proteins such as BIM and Puma can bind to almost all the pro-survival proteins that you look at, whereas others are much more restricted in their binding. 
And this correlated with their activity, at least in systems when you overexpress them. So those very promiscuous binders turn out to be very potent killers, whereas those that they were much more selective turn out to be relatively inert unless they were combined with one another. Together, principally uh, with Jerry and his uh, uh, lab, uh, we then went on over a period of years to really exploit this system to try to understand a little bit more about how to understand how the interactions between these proteins determining whether a cell lives or dies. I think what is important uh, from that piece, from that work, is that we show that in order for efficient cell killing to occur, you essentially need to take out most, if not all, the breaks on the cells that maintain the survival at that time. And this was important in terms of thinking about how we might use small molecules to uh, trigger this uh, uh, cell death by antagonizing the pro-survival proteins. And that's um, uh, the class of molecules that many of you are aware of, known as the BH3 mimetics. Because of my clinical background, one of the things that I've always been very interested in in thinking about therapeutics is really to not only think about potential efficacy, but also think about potential side effects. And the thing that really drove at least my early interest in this was um, a lot of people, in terms of thinking about BH3 mimetics, were thinking about things that were antagonized pro survival proteins. And I always thought that from these kinds of studies, a bin BH3 mimetic would actually be, won't be very good because it's very likely to be toxic to all kinds of cells. And I think that uh, uh, was uh, an important driver of our thinking, uh, uh, certainly uh, from, the, from the very, very early days. So just as an outline for today's uh, talk, I'd like to extend a little bit more of a discussion with you about our current thoughts and, and, and studies uh, with uh, uh, novel anti-cancer compounds, particularly the BH3 mimetics. That's work principally that uh, my lab is doing with, with that of Andrew Roberts. Um, what I wanted to move on there is to think about what are the potential pro-survival proteins we could target and particularly in the context of other uh, tumors, including non-hemopoietic ones. And I think what is important in considering those uh, uh, is not only in thinking about how we can have small molecules to neutralize them. In fact, it turns out that trying to understand how some of these pathways are, are regulated is going to be critical. And, and I'd like to tell you a little bit of a story of, of the, our work on MCL1. And finally, what I would like to do is, um, having um, been asked by Doug to take over the, uh, to start a chemical biology division, is in terms of thinking about what uh, we've learned from these kinds of studies in order to uh, build other uh, platforms and rather other capabilities in terms of uh, uh, drug discovery, particularly in the context of, of cancer. So this is a very old slide, and as many of you know, uh, um, there are good reasons to think that BCL2 will be a very good target. I think um, we probably um, underestimate how <laughs> valuable it, 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 it might have, how good a target it might have been, but in fact, uh, uh, um, it, it's, it's really uh, proven to be the case. I mean, these were uh, work done over 20 years ago now suggesting that BCL2 was a good target, and it is only now with the advent of, of, of small molecules that inhibit BCL2 that we're able to prove that hypothesis in the clinic. So the data comes from a number of different areas, principally the observation that in many uh, cancers, uh, including uh, many ones, many of uh, hemopoietic origin, that B high levels of BCL2 is what is required to sustain them. And the other rationale, of course, as many of you know, is that the, the BCL2 regulated survival pathway is an important hint, uh, a block to the action of many, many cytotoxic drugs. So one disease that's really very well characterized by BCL2 overexpression is this uh, uh, leukemia called chronic lymphocytic leukemia. It is the most common of all leukemias, and in that disease, the primary, primary reason that you get high levels of BCL2 is, is that you get loss of the critical microRNAs that regulate BCL2 expression. So you get upregulation BCL2 mRNA that leads to the accumulation of these uh, very abnormal lymphocytes. Although in the majority of people this is not a very aggressive disease, it can over time uh, evolve, and, and, and currently the treatment is, is mainly uh, of a supportive nature. So it, uh, the couple of cytotoxic drugs, uh, fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, are the mainstay of treatments. 
And probably over the last 10 years, uh, the major difference has been the introduction of the anti-CD20 monoclonal antibodies, rituximab, that's made a big difference in the clinic. What's, we're really at the cusps of probably a major revolution in a clinic in terms of treatment of, of this disease because there's two drugs that are currently in early phase clinical trials, and both of them are looking incredibly exciting. So the first one is a BTK inhibitor, uh, inhibitor of Burton's tyrosine kinase that's now in phase two uh, uh, clinical trials, and really it looks to be very, very promising in, in patients with chronic lymphocytic leukemia. And I'll talk a little bit about the BH3 mimetics. So, Although um, this is, in general, in most patients, uh, it is a fairly indolent disease, there are some patients whose uh, disease is much more aggressive, including ones that are related to specific genetic factors. And one that I touched on uh, briefly today is the loss of the 17, uh, it is a loss of the short arm of chromosome 17 that's usually uh, taken to indicate loss of P53. So this is work, as I say, that's very much done in collaboration with uh, very close co collaboration in Andrew's lab. And the critical people include uh, 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 a number of very talented uh, clinician scientists, Kylie uh, uh, Xiong Ling and, and Carl Lee, a PhD student in the lab, Mary Ann Anderson. So the idea basically is to try to mimic the action of the BH3 on the proteins to take out the action of, of, of BCL2. And as, as I say, it, it, there is good evidence in chronic lymphocytic leukemia, BCL2 is a key, um, key uh, pro-survival factor. You've heard in this forum about uh, drugs such as Nabitoclax or ABT263. So the specificity of Nabitoclax is such that it is really a functional antagonist of BCL2, BCLXL, and BCLW. And the problem with Nabitoclax, although it's showing a great deal of promise in the clinic, is that it also touches BCL-XL, uh, which turns out uh, BCL-XL is a critical survival factor for platelets, so that if you take out BCL-XL, patients uh, 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 get thrombocytopenic, and that then limits the dose of Nabitoclax you can use. So as part of our col collaboration with um, Genentech and with Abbott, there's uh, a, a molecule that's been developed, ABT199, which is essentially a reworked form of ABT263. And the strategy there is to start off with ABT263 to work uh, out uh, the affinity for B cell X cells. So ABT199 has at least 100-fold higher affinity for B cell to over B cell X cell. And it's showing uh, a great promise both in preclinical studies. So this is uh, uh, data that came from Weehive that's now coming out in press, uh, looking at the effect um, in ex vivo on, on platelets or in, in, in CLL samples. So although um, you get as good activity with ABT199 as Nabitoclax on CLL sa samples in culture, it has much, much weaker effect on the viability of platelets. And that's really one of the uh, key drivers for pushing ahead with the program uh, looking at ABT199. So the, the clinical trials on ABT199 you've heard about from, from, from Andrew. And, and it's been going on for over uh, close to a year and a half now. And it certainly, uh, we're very encouraged by, by, by the data so far. And this is a patient of, uh, uh, in Melbourne with a, a small uh, lymphocytic uh, lymphoma who had very bulky abdominal disease. And this disease uh, certainly responded very, very well uh, to uh, treatment with ABT199. And what's important also to point out is not only is, has this patient started off with very bulky disease, uh, this is a very heavily pretreated patient. And often in, 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 to try to get any sort of clinical response, uh, the hardest are the ones that have very heavily pretreated disease. If you look um, now, this is data uh, from back from September. If you look at the number of prognostic markers, whether they are refractory to the standard of care agents such as fludarabine or uh, 70p deletion, which, as I said, is used uh, at least in practice as a marker for, for loss of p53, uh, those patients that, cut, that, that uh, uh, should uh, would normally uh, do very badly uh, um, appear identical to all the subjects. So that's encouraging. It means that uh, there are patients who, who would otherwise be very hard to treat uh, are responsive to ABT199. So one of the questions uh, that Marianne is particularly interested in is this issue of, 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 of uh, 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 
uh, P53 loss. So um, when she looked at her data, so this is uh, taking CLL uh, cells from patients uh, um, either on the trial or off or, or otherwise, and looking at the sensitivity to ABT199, there doesn't seem to be any significant difference uh, whether uh, they harbor the uh, 17P deletion or not. And that would strongly indicate that this uh, agent uh, will work even in patients that uh, would normally do badly because of loss of P53. I just wanted to finish up that part of the talk just by uh, um, um, putting some important thoughts to you because I think this is uh, really um, a, a crucial uh, part of, of, of taking this program ahead. I think of, obviously not all patients re re respond to ABT199. You know, a large number do, uh, um, but we don't really have a good marker as to, to identify which patients uh, do well on, on, on with ABT199. I think that's a really important question uh, for us to answer. Um, obviously, we need to uh, monitor very closely for, for, em for, for, for emergence of resistance and really to try to f uh, figure out beforehand what the likely um, uh, resistance mechanisms is. The only one word I'll say on that is that unlike kinase inhibitors, it seems like the mutation of the target itself is, is, it doesn't occur uh, very frequently or at all, either in uh, preclinical models or in, a, or, 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 in the, or, or in the clinic. And I think that's because um, if you, even if you target VCO2, there are homolog homologous pro, uh, proteins that will function, uh, and usually the, the, the uh, mechanisms by which uh, experimentally uh, these cells become resistant to the drug is usually by upregulation of one or the other pro-survival protein. That seems to be the, by far the, the, the dominant uh, uh, way in which uh, uh, tumor cells evade uh, uh, the BH3 mimetics. We need to think about combination therapy, what are the kinds of combinations are likely to work best. And I think um, um, you would recall uh, from um, the seminar given by Delphine early on this year, I think mechanistically, I think there's still an important question to answer because clearly the work that Delphine and Xiong Lin did that we did in collaboration with Philippe's lab would suggest that the way these BH3 mimetics work is not just by taking out the activity of the pro-survival proteins. It's almost as though the key action is to disrupt the endogenous co uh, complex. At least in the lymphoid compartment, it looks as though the key, the key action of this BH3 mimetics is to disrupt the complex between BCL2 and BIM. I think that does have an implication because I think that makes us think slightly differently of trying to identify what uh, a particular uh, BH3 mimetic will work in a particular context. So from this work, there's clearly you know, th a thought about think, uh, targeting other pro-survival proteins. And um, as part of that uh, thinking a number of years ago, we, we started a project, our friend Freya uh, started as an honor student in the lab back in early 2010. So she did her honors, uh, was co-supervised by Andrew and myself. And this is work that she's done uh, with uh, Seong Lin and, 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 and Toro. So Freya, uh, having been an honors student here for years, spent a year as a, a research assistant, and now just completed her first year at uh, uh, medical school. So the idea is that can we exploit um, the, 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 the specificities that we uh, determine from the biochemical assays and also uh, studies in a limited number of model systems such as principally using fibroblasts, can we exploit that in a more general sense? So I've already told you that a BH3 only protein such as BIM will take out the action of all the pro survival proteins. We know that if you engineer a form of BIM that harbors only the BH3 domain of BAD, it only takes out BCL2, BCLXL, and BCLW, just in the same way as ABT737 does. And an important tool that came to our hands uh, 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 and was generally shared with us was this uh, uh, um, variant called BIM2A. So BIM2A was uh, 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 discovered and characterized by Arena Lee and, and, and Doug Fairley, and it was a uh, a variation on, on wild type BIM that had a, 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 a that was biochemically and functionally a selective antagonist of MCL1. So that allowed us an additional tool in order to try to figure out in each uh, tumor uh, what is the most likely uh, survival protein that keeps them alive. So uh, the first thing Freya did was to validate 
um, um, this reagent as an MCL1 antagonist, and she used two uh, multiple myeloma cell lines, which was known from genetic studies to be MCL1 dependent. So if you overexpress uh, BIM that takes out all the pro-survival proteins, these cells die compared to an inert variant, for example, BIM4E here. So that's expected. So the critical question for us is whether BIM2A, which functions as an MCL1 antagonist, whether these cells were sensitive to BIM2A and they were sensitive as well. So Freya used uh, these uh, kinds of experiments to validate it. And the other thing that we were very fortunate was really the, the, the fantastic efforts at, at, of Toru to um, generate a series of vectors that would allow us to do these kinds of experiments. And the most sophisticated ones he's generated is, is essentially a DOCS-inducible system, uh, which allowed uh, the expression of a gene of, gene of interest, in this case BIM, uh, when we add, uh, added doxycycline into the system. So we tested it in, in, in fibroblasts. So if you engineer fibroblasts to be completely reliant on MCL1, so that's uh, if you use uh, uh, fibroblasts deficient on, uh, or deficient on BCL -X cell, you can see that these uh, fibroblasts over a period of time are killed by BIM expression and, and they're also killed by BIM2A. Armed with those uh, information and those tools, uh, what Freya did was to uh, look at a whole panel of uh, uh, tumor cell lines that were available, uh, the NCI60 panel. And what she then looked at was the sensitivity of each of these lines to um, either the BIM variant or to BH3 mimetics. So uh, 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 we plotted the results here just as a heat map, and this is uh, the data shown, shown uh, 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 as a as a viability assay, and, and that, that's just given as a range. Just for simplicity's sake, she uh, clustered them into uh, 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 situations where you get very potent killing, where you get reduced viability, where you get some killing, or, 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 or what you call them to be inert. As you can see, what you expect is that most of the cell lines are, are, are very sensitive to BIM overexpression. There are some exceptions, and we've figured out some of them. We know why. For example, there are some lines that just happen to be backspec deficient, uh, so they, they are not, uh, uh, because they lack the downstream mediators of apoptosis, they are, are resistant to, to BIM overexpression. When you look at the, the pattern, you clearly see that the, the number of hemopoietic cell lines that are sensitive to either BIM-BAD that takes out BCL2, BCL-X cell, BCLW, or essentially just ABT737. And that's consistent with, with, with uh, other observations that it's only a small number of cell lines that are sensitive to ABT737, and they're principally uh, those of hemopoietic origin. What uh, took our attention was that uh, with BIM2A, which is, as I said, is MCL1 selective ligand, there seemed to be a greater proportion of melanoma cell lines that were uh, sensitive to uh, BIM2A overexpression. And that uh, we didn't know, and it was a surprise to us. So in collaboration uh, with uh, Grant MacArthur over at uh, Peter Mack um, and his colleagues, we actually looked at a much pa larger panel of melanoma cell lines, so it's about uh, 40 melanoma cell lines that, that Freya has looked at here. So over 50% of melanoma cell lines that we have av available uh, seem to be sensitive to, 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 to BIM2A overexpression. What's more interesting is, is uh, to try, uh, what's also important is to try to confirm the results, and we knew that uh, uh, a BIM variant that harbored only the BH3 only domain of NOXA was also MCL1 selective, and you get a very good correlation uh, between the data that she got uh, when overexpressing BIM2A or BIM, BIM NOXA, whereas uh, BIM BAD, which is a different uh, specificity, you didn't get any correlation. So that strongly implicates that uh, uh, MCL1 is the target in these cells. What we Freya then next went on to do was really to figure out whether. Uh, in the context of the known uh, common mutations in mal malignant melanoma, is there any correlation between uh, sensitivity to overexpression of BIM2A, in other words, dependent of MCL1? So when she looked at whether cells were wild type uh, for, 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 for BRAF, which is probably the most common mutation in this disease, or heterozygous, so that carried the V600E mutation, she really didn't see any, uh, 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 any correlation. And that at least 
at this level of analysis would suggest that MCL1 may be an alternative target uh, for, for BRAF mutated tumors. And I think from a clinical perspective, that is actually a very important observation. What is important uh, for us also to address is, is whether this in vitro sensitivity is just a fluke of cells in culture and whether this is reflected in vivo. So the limited experiments we've done so far um, uh, do seem encouraging. So this is a, a cell line that in culture that we found to be uh, BIM2A uh, 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 sensitive. So these uh, cells were engineered by, by Freya to express either BIM uh, inducibly an inert form of BIM or BIM2A, which is the MCL1 selective ligand. And once uh, the tumors are established in a xenograft model in mice, uh, they were either uh, fed uh, just with uh, uh, dilute or fed with doxycycline to in induce expression of, of, of these genes of interest. And you can see whether you induce expression of BIM or BIM2A, you get a, 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 an impact on the growth of the tumor uh, in this xenograft model. So as I say, at least in, in, at this level of analysis, it does look encouraging. I think importantly for us to do now is to, um, to establish whether these studies with uh, cell lines really reflect the true situation in, 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 in malignant melanomas. And this is uh, ongoing work that we'll undertake with Grant and Mark Shackleton over at the Peter Mac. I think what we've been trying to do is to identify which uh, primary melanomas are sensitive uh, and or which of the even the melanoma cell lines are, are sensitive to BIM2A. And at least at looking at protein expression level, we, we, we can't uh, uh, easily determine which lines are, are BIM2A sensitive. And I think that's uh, going to be important to determine. Um, of course, the important issue from our perspective is whether this can be translated in the clinic. So the, the first thought we have is there are a number of uh, drugs around, the number of agents around that's known to um, uh, modulate MCL1 protein levels or MCL1 uh, 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 function. So the question is whether, uh, whether these uh, 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 agents might be used. So uh, Huisan Chin, when she was an honor student in the lab last year, she took a panel of the melanoma cell lines that were sensitive to BIM2A uh, overexpression or not. So these were uh, the ones that were most sensitive and ones that were least sensitive. And she looked at a panel of drugs. So I'll show you examples of two here, uh, a drug called aroscovitin and another drug called flavoperidol. And what she just looked at at two time points at 24 and 72 hours and look at the sensitivity of these cells, uh, uh, whether they're uh, been to a uh, sensitive or not. And there doesn't seem to be a very striking difference between the sensitivity of these cells to agents that modulate uh, MCL1 levels. So it probably means that these uh, 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 drugs have, have many targets, and, and one of the targets may be MCL1, and probably not the, not the only target. So um, because we currently don't have, unlike uh, BCL2 that you can target with compounds like uh, ABT199 or BCLX cell you can target with compounds like ABT263 or ABT737. We currently don't have compounds to target pro-survival MCL1. And for a number of other reasons, um, um, uh, we uh, have continued to maintain a strong interest in this area. And I just wanted to share with you a couple of un un unpublished stories that I think uh, may be interesting. So this was work really that was uh, started uh, by Mark Van Delft when he was a, uh, a PhD student with, with, with Jerry Adams and myself, then carried on by Toru Okamoto until he returned to take up a position at the University of Osaka and currently continued by uh, Lei Liu, who's a postdoc in the lab. So the background to this is that, as, as you all know, uh, uh, the key... Uh, uh, restraint on, on, on activation of backs and back is the pro-survival proteins. And once you have a stress signal that upregulate BH3 on the proteins, they take away, take out the action of the pro-survival BCL2 proteins that allow backs and back to act. So in absence of any uh, restraint, backs and back are unleashed to kill. It seems to be a critical, uh, 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 the most critical uh, uh, limit, the, the most limiting thing in this uh, 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 step is uh, clearly the amount of the pro-survival BCL2 proteins that's available to restrain backs and back. And in that regard, MCL1 is particularly interesting because it turns out to be a very, very labile protein and has been observed by, by, 
by, uh, by many groups. So many kinds of stress stimuli can uh, provoke MCL1 degradation. And in many instances, that's uh, dependent on, on, on degradation through the proteasome. So if you have uh, DNA damaging agents like etoposide, you get a marked degradation of MCL1. Uh, or if you UV radiate cells, I'm sorry, mislabeled it, uh, the cells also get markedly, the amounts of MCL1 also get mass markedly reduced in cells that are UV radiated. And in most of those can cases, that uh, can be blocked by the proteasome inhibitors such as, uh, proteasome inhibitors such as MG132. Um, Simon Willis, when he was a, a PhD student uh, with Jerry and myself, also observed that uh, um, NOXA, the BH3 only proteins, is very atypical in the sense that it's not only bound to, to, to MCL1, what it was also able to do was to provoke MCL1 uh, degradation. Now, um, we then went on uh, uh, to try to understand some of the mechanisms that drive uh, the degradation of MCL1. So this is work that uh, Mark did uh, before he left for John Dick's lab in, in, in Toronto. So he was trying to map uh, uh, the, the residues on MCL1, on mouse MCL1 that were important for, for its degradation. So that based on a number of other lines of evidence, uh, he proposed that the three important residues in mouse MCL1 were lysine, uh, 117, 175, and 178. So he engineered mutations of those changing lysines to arginine. And if you mutate 175 and 178 in the context of, uh, of, of mouse MC1, you can see that the, uh, the, that the degradation that's induced by, by, by overexpression of NOXA is, is, is abolished. However, UV radiation carries on regardless. So what we concluded from this is that the mechanism by which uh, NOXA induced uh, the, the degradation of MC1 is distinct from that that's triggered by UV radiation. What about the basal turnover of, of MCL1? So in this case, we just use a protein synthesis inhibitor, uh, cyclohexamide, and chase uh, uh, MCL1 over a period of time after treatment with, 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 uh, with, with, uh, with cyclohexamide. And those mutations uh, that abolish the, the, the degradation induced by NOXA, those mutations did not affect uh, that uh, 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 triggered by basal turnover. So it suggests that the basal turnover occurred by, by mechanism, mechanism that's different. And we know uh, by looking at NOXA deficient cells that's provided by Andreas's lab that the amount of MC1 in those cells uh, is the same as uh, wild type mice. And that told us that uh, NOXA cannot be the critical uh, regulator of, of basal MC1 levels. So we've been musing uh, along these lines, and, and of course, uh, um, 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 the one question you could ask is, is, what are the consequences if you just stabilize MCL1? We know that in many disease states, in many cancers uh, 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 that we discussed early on, it's often marked by overexpression of, of BCL2. And in the context of this, we, we came upon a, a, a very useful finding for us in, in, in a way, and, and that's looking at mice that were engineered in a division to have a flux allele of MCL1. So obviously these mice were made so that um, uh, MCL1 can be deleted at will uh, in, in, in a specific time and place as was required. So these mice uh, were born, uh, are born with expected frequency, they are basically uh, grossly normal, and if you look at most of the organs and Don has also looked very carefully at the hemopoietic system, they look very normal. The one thing that puzzled us for quite a little while is that the male mice are infertile. So Lee Coulters looked at that more carefully, and if you look in the testes of the MCL1 flux flux mice, their, uh, the epididymis is essentially empty, unlike uh, even the heterozygous state, I'm sorry, that should be a flox plus, uh, which are full of sperm, the mice that were flox flox uh, were completely de devoid of any uh, 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 testes. Phenotypically, um, Lee, uh, having looked at a number of these mice before, uh, thinks that the, 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 the appearance and the, character and the characteristics of the uh, block in, 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 in spermatogenesis in these mice very closely re, uh, resemble those of the combined loss of the BH3 only proteins, uh, BIM and BLK. Although we can't formally prove that, um, our working hypothesis at least is that 
in terms of thinking about this because of the uh, uh, pheno phenotypic similarity to mice that lack uh, BIM and P BLK1, uh, a, a suggestion would be that perhaps MCL1 might be hyperactive in these MCL1 flux flux mice. So the other observation that went along uh, uh, um, and we puzzled over for a little while is that um, Mark uh, um, actually made lysates from uh, uh, cells that were isolated from MCL1 flux flux mice. And what he found was that um, the MCL1 protein in these cells were actually, was actually larger than that from wild type mice. And that was just completely unexpected because uh, what we were expecting were, were, was protein of the uh, same size. So Philippe went back and, uh, and sequenced the locus in which uh, uh, the, the mice were made. So this is the flux locus. And as many of you were away, um, it's a very neat locus because it uh, also has um, introduced into it uh, the human CD4 gene as a reporter of MCL1 expression. As I say, fl flanking uh, uh, the, the, the MCL1 sequence are two LOXP sites. And if you sequence upstream of the start site of, MTG, of, of MCL1, there was in frame another ATG that would result in addition of 13 amino acids at the end terminus of MCL1. However, if you look carefully in fibroblasts or in thymus, and Toru has looked in a number of other tissues, the levels of MCL1 is exactly the same as wild type. Uh, mice. And he's also done uh, uh, RT-PCR to look at, at RNA expression. And again, they're, they're indistinguishable from, from wild-type mice. What uh, is very different about this protein, so we call this protein NADD, MCL1 for the N-terminal addition with the additional 13 amino acids, is that this protein is much more stable than uh, wild-type MCL1. So uh, just to prove that this is not anything that's inherent uh, to the flux locus, uh, what we've done is to introduce either wild type or NADD MC MCL1 into cells that are deficient in MCL1 and then chase uh, MCL1 uh, levels uh, for the treatment of cyclohexamide. You can see that uh, unlike the half-life of about 30 minutes of wild type MCL1, NADD MCL1 has a half-life of about four hours, if not more. And it's also much more resistant to degradation induced by, by UV uh, uh, treatment. So uh, because uh, uh, this loci doesn't uh, uh, encode for wild-type MC1, at least for this purpose, it really, uh, uh, we call this MC1 ST because stabilized form of MC1. What's interesting about this form of MC01 is that if you look at NOXA induced degradation, you recall that I, uh, I introduced to you early on um, the if you overexpress the BH3 on the protein NOXA, it triggers uh, MC01 degradation. This form of MC01 is still completely degraded by, by, by NOXA, consistent with our, our early observations that the degradation that's driven by NOXA overexpression is different from that driven by, by uh, during basal turnover. Um, so uh, um, um, Toru did a, a number of, of biochemical experiments to characterize this a bit further. And what is clear is that there is a, a degradation signal or degron that's at end terminus of, of, of MCL1. So if he successively takes off uh, uh, larger chunks of the end terminus of MCL1, he can uh, reach a point if he takes up about 30 amino acids of, of the end terminus of MCL1, these proteins are much more stable than the parent protein. And this signal, importantly, is also can be transferable. So if he puts onto a, a, a construct and codes for, for BCLW, if he just puts on the first 30 amino acids of MCL1 in this construct here, um, you can see that compared to the parent compound, uh, parent uh, 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 molecule, this, this uh, uh, tag is, is uh, much more labile, but you now put the additional sequence at NADD, you now abolish that effect. So there is a degradation signal at the end terminus of MCL1, and that's transferable. Um, when does, it, uh, does the stabilization impact on, upon function? I've already told you that it can't be a huge effect, at least because in the MCL1 flux flux mice that only have the stabilized form of MCL1, the mice, as I told you, appear grossly normal. If you look uh, in, within the hemopoietic compartment, if you look at thymocytes or B cells, uh, most of the responses to, to, 
to uh, stimuli that induce apoptosis, uh, uh, these cells com uh, behave completely normally. However, there are some exceptions. So uh, when you looked at uh, 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 fibroblasts, in this case, either from wild type or the uh, MC1 uh, STSC, those cells are much more resistant to a number of agents such as uh, etoposide and UV treatment, whereas others are completely unaffected. So what's most important to us was to try to figure out whether this is really important physiologically. And uh, we, we got a bit of a lucky break because um, we were interested in generating fibroblasts uh, uh, with, uh, of a different genetic background, it's mainly uh, for the kinds of studies that I introduced to you in the early part of the talk, trying to figure out the signaling pathways. And we've set out the cross uh, really to look up uh, to, to, in order to generate uh, cells that were both MCL1 and VCL2 deficient. So we cross MCL1 flock spines with the VCL2 knockout mouse. Just remember, uh, just to uh, uh, remind you that uh, when you delete MCL1, the, uh, if you delete uh, BCL2, the BCL2 uh, knockout mouse are small. Uh, they are runted and they die prematurely, principally because they develop polycystic kidney disease. Moreover, they turn pr prematurely gray because uh, melanocytes are critically dependent on, 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 on BCL2 for the survival. The reason we got very curious was that one day um, um, I got a call to say that um, there was a, a, a gray mouse born uh, and, was, and had grown to normal size. And when you looked at the genotype, so this was a BCL2 knockout mouse, but it was an MCL1 STSD with a FOX allele. So born, uh, but uh, 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 in contrast to the straight BCL2 uh, knockout mouse, this mouse is a normal size. And in fact, grew, it grows to a size that's comparable to wild type mice. So we concluded from this is the MCL1 ST uh, can at least partially compensate for the loss of BCL2. And it does so because uh, the polycystic kidney disease that you see uh, with uh, BCL2 deficiency is significantly uh, reduced uh, when you have MCL1 uh, ST allele present. And that uh, uh, translates to uh, uh, increased lifespan. It clearly doesn't correct the deficiency uh, completely because uh, in a dose-dependent manner, you get partial correction. They don't still live as, as long as wild-type mice, but they clearly live longer. What's interesting in this context, of course, um, is that presumably the, 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 the prolonged survival of, we would hypothesize that prolonged survival or the, the longer lived form of, of MCL1 within the kidney is sufficient to compensate for the loss of BCL2. But in the context of melanocytes, either MCL1 is not expressed or destabilization of MCL1 is not sufficient to correct for the loss of BCL2. And those are experiments that will be interesting to do, but uh, we, we haven't done them as yet. In the context of, of, of what we're interested in, of course, uh, we want to see whether uh, this allele can also promote tumor formation. So the experiments that, that Toru did was uh, um, really, um, in, a, in a way, that the lowest bar test he started with is to look at transformation in, in fibroblasts uh, using combination of oncogenes, so uh, using combination of MIG and RAS is a well-known assay. And at least in the number of independent experiments uh, he was able to do, you get much more colonies form if you derive the fibroblasts from the MCL and STSC genetic background. The other experiment he did was to look at uh, uh, leukemia formation if you uh, introduce uh, oncogenic uh, uh, retroviruses into the fetal liver cells, either wild type or MCL and STSC. And what he looked at was introducing uh, either CMIC or in collaboration with Stefan Glasser, uh, introduction of the NLL -E ENL fusion oncoprotein. If you look at MIC uh, uh, in this context, so uh, MIC, when introduced into CMIC, when introduced into fetal liver cells, induce an acute myeloid leukemia, not a B-cell leukemia. And you can see in a dose-dependent manner, uh, the MCL1 ST allele uh, can uh, promote uh, 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 leukemia formation in this context. It's, it's actually pretty context-dependent. If you look at MLL, ENL, there's no difference whatsoever. So, uh, what we concluded from, from these work in, in terms of mechanistic understanding, there's clearly a pathway that depends on ubiquitination of key lysines, and, and that's mediated by 
uh, E3 ligases such as NEO, or uh, uh, the other one is the E3 ligase, uh, domain containing E3 ligase FBW7 that we identified in collaboration with uh, Visual Dixit's group. And that clearly is lysine dependent uh, uh, ubiquitination of MCL1. And that drives MCL1 uh, degradation in particular situations. So the not so one probably falls into this context because as I uh, discussed with you, uh, uh, Mutating the two critical uh, uh, lysines in uh, uh, MCO1 uh, basically abolish its uh, degradation. But there are other pathways that are involved, and clearly uh, these uh, are of interest, and, 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 and this is now work uh, that's continued by Lay, is to try to identify what are the pathways uh, that control uh, basal uh, uh, MCO1 turnover. So it le really leaves us with the question is, is whether um, if we can't target MCL1 using BH3 mimetic compounds, so we don't have uh, our compounds that target uh, 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 MCL1 that way, can we exploit uh, the, 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 the labile nature? Can we exploit the pathways that normally drive MCL1 degradation? Can they be exploited in the context of, of, of therapeutics? And that uh, um, I haven't got the answer to, uh, but that, that hopefully uh, we'll be able to determine with, with some of these studies. So I want to move on now in the last uh, quarter of an hour or so to, to the last part of my talk, which is uh, partly our efforts uh, uh, in, in thinking about other uh, ways of undertaking uh, drug discovery. And the, the, the problem, as many of you are aware, uh, uh, drug discovery and development generally is a very resource intensive. It takes a lot of time. So ABT263, the, uh, the, the drug that went in the clinic uh, uh, in about 2005, 2006 was a result of a 10-year program at Abbott. Um, and it, it, it carries huge risks in order to do that. And even large pharmaceutical companies are somewhat reluctant to embark on some of them unless um, um, they are on a certain winner because uh, 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 the risk is so high. And in academia, there are very few groups, and we were very fortunate uh, with the uh, uh, working on, uh, on, on cell death that's um, that Suzanne, Jerry, and Andreas, and Peter Coleman, and others, were able to cobble together resources to, 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 uh, uh, to have the sustained uh, uh, effort that's required for, for such a project. Yet, I would argue very strongly that people like us in academia are actually in the best position to do early discovery because you are the best ones to know the pathway involved. And often, many of us have the best mouse models. And if you look at, uh, if you talk to uh, people in industry, they might be working at a particular molecular target, but they have no idea of the right mouse models to use, and they don't have access to those. So I think we're actually well placed in that regard, regard uh, to, to, do, to do drug discovery. So uh, in thinking about this, you know, what I uh, thought might be useful was to try to see how we can use uh, uh, the kinds of things that we can do here, um, exploit our expertise uh, through the screening lab, and so I in assay development, but critically uh, um, what is uh, changing over time and is changing very quickly is that there are more and more tool and probe compounds that are coming online. So there are various programs that people look at targeting various kinases or targeting uh, regulator proteins, and a lot of them are actually pretty good uh, tools, and that is continuing to be improved. So, um, together uh, with a number of colleagues, um, uh, principally um, work, uh, uh, working together with Chris Burns, who uh, essentially will be taking over this project, we uh, started um, a, a project around cell-based phenotypic screens using uh, recognized uh, two molecules. So, uh, Suzanne uh, Wan, who's a, who's a research assistant in the high-throughput screening lab, has essentially done all the bench work that, that, that to go with this project in terms of screening under the oversight of Kurt and of, 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 of David Siegel. Um, Chris and, and Georgina has been critical in, in assembling the, the kinds of libraries together with Kurt that we want to use. And as a starter, we, we've been working very closely with, with our colleagues in cancer hematology, principally with Stefan, because of the, of the mouse models of AML that has developed. And also, we've had a lot of input from, from Andrew Wilkes and, 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 and Andrew Way. So the first disease we want to tackle and to think about is uh, acute myeloid leukemia. And, and the, the reason 
for that, at least for me, is that I have some understanding of its biology. And I think what's also important is that although there's been some advances in, in uh, treatment for patients with AML, um, 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 in many groups, um, in the older patients, those with uh, poor cytogenetic markers, essentially the prognosis hasn't changed over the last 40 years. And the other feature about AML to, think, to remember is that um, it, although you can classify it based on the genetics, classify it based on the uh, morphological markers into different subtypes of AML, it really is a family of very complex genetic disorders that's, uh, you know, if you look at the chromosomal changes as well as the genes evolved, so it's, re it's really very uh, complex. The other thing that driven our thinking in this is that um, although a number of targeted agents have been developed, um, one most notable one is uh, inhibitors of, of FLT3. Um, many of them have, have really not been uh, very successful. So we, we've really been thinking about trying uh, uh, an alternative and complementary approaches to uh, specifically looking at targeted. So in a targeted approach, you'd be thinking about developing small molecules that uh, antagonize uh, RAS, for example, or RUN, RUNS X1. So these kinds of cell-based phenotypic screens are, 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 have been done, you know, some have been reported, and so earlier this year there was a report from the uh, group at the Sanger Institute where they screened a few hundred cell lines against uh, a small panel of compounds, they were, they were in the tens, and what was uh, very striking from, uh, from that study is that they were able to identify uh, inhibitors of PARP as a potential uh, 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 treatment uh, for uh, Ewing sarcoma because uh, there's a common uh, chromosomal translocation, Ewing sarcoma, and all the cell lines that harbor that chromosomal translocation uh, were sensitive to in inhibitors of PARP. And that, I think, uh, points to the value of doing these kinds of screens, particularly in the context of finding something un unexpected and thinking about uh, 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 find finding compounds that can induce uh, synthetic lethality. So um, the, the way we, we set this up is really very simple, is to um, uh, array a, a, a series of, of, of compounds. So we started off with a library of kinase inhibitors that were made available to us by uh, uh, synthesis mechanism through Andrew Wilkes that we collected about 131 kinase inhibitors. And we essentially looked at the viability of these cells uh, after 48 hour incubation with a range of concentrations of, of these kinase inhibitors. So the first uh, experiment just to establish the, the model was just looking at a series of uh, leukemia cell lines. And um, uh, uh, um, so there's uh, about 10 or a dozen leukemia cell lines um, that we looked at. Um, the way the data has, is shown here is that because these are known uh, inhibitors, we've uh, scored everything that's weaker than two micromolar as in negative or in green. Uh, um, um, in gray is, is, is about half a, uh, is half a micromolar EC50 uh, down to, uh, uh, in the rates are the ones that are very sensitive. So this compound here, for example, kills all, all, the, all the cell lines that we looked at. So what one is looking for are things like this that uh, hits uh, uh, some of the lines but not other lines and, and looking for patterns. Um, I think this will potentially be very valuable for us to try to uh, uh, figure out what uh, each of these lines are particularly sensitive to, and, and that's part of an ongoing analysis. The way uh, 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 the, 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 the compounds are also grouped together are essentially grouped together based on their uh, known class of targets. So for example, um, there are things in here that hit uh, BCR able that are clustered together. So I think that, that's a, a potentially, potentially interesting and, 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 and way to go in terms of trying to identify uh, what these uh, are cell lines are susceptible to. The problem with, of course, using cell lines is that what we might be reading out is not um, really the, the sensitivity of that particular tumor to a particular agent. What we might just be reading out is a feature of that cell line that's acquired during its immortalization process. So that's a big advantage, a disadvantage of using cell lines. So what we're particularly interested in is to look, look at different models. 
Just a very quick word about the kinase inhibitor library. Chris has now got up to the third set that now has uh, 210 discrete inhibitors, including ones to uh, BTK, for example. And uh, we, uh, through a number of uh, uh, collaborations, have, have also included some proprietary compounds that uh, um, may av be, be available depending on the nature of, of the kinds of screens that people want to do, and other compounds are in the pipeline. So what we were most interested in doing is really using mouse models of, of, of AML in, in the first context. And, and because it takes us away from this problem of using cell lines. And the other advantage, at least uh, in, in, in this system, is that we're able to then access large homogeneous populations of cells uh, that can be harvested straight from the mouse and taken um, to, to the lab uh, for, for testing. And, 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 and the other advantage is that down the track, we can potentially man manipulate the system, uh, in, even in the context of genetic background, to try to figure out the, the mechanism. So Stefan has got a, a long uh, a list. Uh, he's obviously very busy uh, generating various mouse models. And what we're interested in is obviously looking at things that hit just leukemias or things that hit specific uh, leukemias, for example. So in preliminary studies, looking at, so these are a panel of, uh, of independently derived ML, uh, ENL-driven uh, uh, acute leukemias in the mouse. So these were, uh, um, the mouse come down uh, with the acute leukemia, they're transplanted once, and then the cells were harvested and the experiment done. So these are three wild-type bone marrows, and there are clearly differences between uh, the leukemias from the wild-type bone marrows. I think what's interesting is that there are clearly things that are common to all the leukemias, but there are also things that are common to some, of, but not all, the leukemias. And the reason I just wanted to uh, mention for us to show this heat, heat map is just to remind me is that um, this is a format that many of you are used to viewing the data. And of course, what we want to intersect this data is essentially the, the genetic basis of these leukemias, because the differences in the sensitivity would presumably be a reflection of the different in, in, in genetic makeup of those, of those leukemias. So uh, um, this is really part of ongoing project that uh, Chris is driving. Uh, we also got a collection of compounds that uh, uh, target ep epigenetic uh, modifiers and also compounds that have a known mechanism of action. Um, just to finish up uh, uh, for today's uh, uh, talk, I just wanted to mention that um, the robotics is now uh, uh, set up in, in Parkfield uh, site and sits down in level 5 east and Susan has moved from Bandura uh, 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 to Parkfield which will allow us to do many of these kinds of experiments and of course the reason for the robotics being sited at Parkfield is um, to allow um, all of us here at Parkfield to access uh, uh, the, the technology that comes and the power that comes with automation. So. Um, I have, through the course of the talk, I mentioned most of the people that have done the work that I alluded to here. I want to thank a whole lot of people who have contributed, particularly uh, people uh, in my lab who are underlying. And having been at WeHi for a number of years, I, and seeing that um, you know, we come towards the time of the year where one becomes a little bit more re reflective and sentimental, I do particularly want to thank um, many colleagues who have been uh, very uh, supportive and, and collaborative, particularly uh, Jerry, Philippe, Suzanne Andres in Molecular Genetics and Cancer Division, and we continue to work closely together on a number of projects uh, with uh, uh, Peter Coleman, Peter Zabata, uh, colleagues over in Cancer Hematology, um, Ben Carl, uh, it's a long-standing collaboration work that I haven't talked about today, but, and of course, Andrew Roberts, and of course, uh, my, my, my uh, colleagues in the Chemical Biology Division. Thank you very much for attention. Some systems, the, 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 um, you know, the mouse is not wild type, uh, but uh, we haven't looked outside. I think, I think, um, 
I was talking about this with Andres uh, yesterday because he said, you know, uh, why is it in some contexts it only produce tumour? But it might be that it's actually quite a subtle mutation. So it, it's really just tipping it down slightly. And it just depends on the threshold for survival and the threshold for tumour genesis in that particular cell type that I'm handling. Don't. Right, well, well, Dr. <laughs> hey, David. Great stuff. Um, I'm sorry to butt in, but I That's can't it. resist. Um, your stable MCL1, very, very interesting story. It would seem that it should still be sensitive to noxa driven yeah. uh, degradation, yeah. right? So, do you further stabilize by producing those two lysine mutants? We're looking into that at the moment. Um, uh, um, so we, um, in terms of basal turnover, um, I don't think we've done that experiment. So uh, it's a good experiment. We've not looked at that. It's, um, you know, and also in the context of your uh, tumor genesis, I yeah. wonder if that's where you'll see the really yeah. smashing effects yeah. in, in uh, acceleration. I, you know, others than me have got bigger mouse budgets than I have. I was happy to inherit a mouse accidentally. But, uh. <laughs> you should have thought on that, David, that uh, the levels of MCO1 probably are higher in very specific cell populations to account for the fact that sometimes you see yeah, I, I don't know effects and other times you, yeah. what you said in the tissues you've looked yeah. at, yeah. the levels are yeah. about the same. In the tissues we look at is about the same. Uh, what I think is more likely is that under conditions of stress, um, when MCR levels are degrade, um, the same life form hangs about long enough. You know, you can imagine in the in the oncogenic context that might well be very important. One final question. <laughs> Do you think uh, the the Stabilized form of MCL1 has other roles in um, many other common cancers such as lung or colorectal cancers? Not tested. Somebody, they would like to do the experiment in the world, would be very welcome. We, uh, you know, we looked at what we can look at really just to have a, 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 a see the systems that were uh, quickest for us. Um, we, we haven't looked in other contexts. I mean, the only thing I could say is that. Um, um, one of the experiments that Toru did uh, when he first came to the lab, he actually um, screened an entire NCI 16 panel of cell line for MCI one stability. Um, and there are certainly a handful of cell lines in that in which uh, MCI one is much more stable than other cell lines. We don't know whether that's biologically relevant or not. I think we should just thank Dave for a great talk.